can you just explain your like background in sport kind of before you reached the FA? Um, I think it'd be good to know that. Yeah, of course. So, um, well, if I reference football first, football has always been my passion. It was a sport I played um, as a school kid, and then when I went on to university, I was um, I went to Loughborough, and um, I'm going back many moons before you will even remember when you were a twinkle in your mother and father's eye. But we uh, at that stage, Loughborough has, has always had a reputation for. Um, elite sports. Um, the football programme at that time played in the universities championship, so I ended up playing for British universities, but we also used to play against professional reserve sides at the time. So I was always passionate about that, and then post-university, after I'd done my master's degree, I continued to play kind of semi-pro level, sort of a bit of a journeyman, if I'm perfectly mm-hmm. honest, but sort of a little bit with Boston United and Kettering, uh, a bit with Burton Albion, and then you know, kind of fell off down the pyramid a little bit. But coincidentally around then, um, I was worse, keep working at Loughborough University after I graduated in some of the early programmes around sports science support uh, to, to national governing bodies. I'm, I'm talking now sort of 1991. And um, we used to support through that programme everything from county cricket teams to uh, canoe squads to uh, mm-hmm. local rugby teams like Northampton to uh, a bit of football work with, with Notts Forest. We used to run pre-season for them or fitness testing, that kind of thing. And then um, in, in the middle of that period, um, a good friend of mine was working with Leicester Tigers who were uh, rugby union was amateur then, but... Um, the amateurs were pretty professional in the sense that although people like Martin Johnson, who was a player then, would, was working for Midland Bank, he was up in the morning training early, um, then the club would train on a Tuesday and Thursday evening and then play on the weekend. So a friend of mine was working with the squad as one of the first you know, fitness coaches. He went back to New Zealand and he said, do you fancy taking it over? And that led me to make a decision that um, I I pack in my you know, semi-professional brown envelope, uh, if you could, on the weekend, uh, enjoyable stuff to, to commit to to that. And I, I didn't I didn't really know anything about rugby, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, I was the skinny, <laughs> 75 kilo footballer uh, being thrust into this rugby environment, um, but but really enjoyed it because I guess what I what I found was they were really open-minded to accept somebody who didn't really know anything about their game but knew kind of about fitness and conditioning and all those kinds of things. So I spent a really enjoyable few years at Leicester and it sort of, it, 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 it strode across the period when the game became professional. And, and coincidentally throughout that period I was also doing some work through the university with some of the England rugby age group teams which eventually culminated in doing some work with the under-21s, uh, which is when I first met Clive Woodward, uh, who was coaching the under-21s at that point. Um, and then Clive went on to become the first full-time coach of the, of the England rugby team. Um, and he didn't immediately take him, me with him. I was working with the RFU at that stage in a more formal capacity with some of their age group teams. And I continued to do so. Um, and I used to run some of the supporting programs for the senior England team. Um, but then uh, after the sort of 1998 tour of hell, that where you know, players like Johnny Wilkinson had a baptism, a baptism of fire and beat 76 nil by Australia, hmm. um, Clive brought me into the fold and I took over the role as, as national fitness coach, uh, working with the senior England team from that point on. And I... Stayed working with Clive and the, and the team from, from 1998 um, through the World Cup in 99, where we got knocked out in the quarterfinal, um, and then through 2003, where we won it. Um, I did the Lions story uh, tour to New Zealand in 2005. I almost went to Southampton Football Club with Clive um, at that point. I'd also been offered a job at Everton with David Moyes, which I turned down in favour of Lions tour. And I eventually got made redundant or left the RFU in 2006. Um, and I guess 
if it's helpful, the, the, the sort of highlights of that period of time when I reflect on it were really, you know, working with Clive as an incredibly charismatic visionary leader who, who really celebrated thinking outside the box and how we could use diverse thinking to take England to the top of the world in rugby union. Um, and that made a, a lifelong impression on me in terms of that way of thinking, but also I think his relatively unique capacity to bring together a very diverse group of people who um, healthily disagreed all the time in pursuit of the, the sort of lofty goals we'd set ourselves. So that was that kind of part of the journey. And then um, following the RFU, I then um, had a period of probably four or five years running my own consultancy business, which covered everything from working. I did some rugby union work. I did a big review for the Welsh Rugby Union. I did some stuff with Scottish golf. And I also did a fair bit of stuff in football with doing performance and strategy reviews for teams like um, Man City when Stuart Pearce was coming to the end of his tenure, um, Fulham, uh, Reading, uh, Watford when A.D. Boothroyd was there mm. and Mark Ashton. Um, and then eventually, uh, and, and really that role was exciting because I enjoyed you know, back in football, but it was at arm's length and I... I I found the game quite frustrating. So coming out of rugby union, which had been so embracing of different thinking, mm. football was definitely not. You know, football was quite insular actually, and and sort of there were lots of cultural barriers to change that, that that didn't seem to make a lot of sense to me, but was incredibly valuable experience for me over that period of time. Um, I then uh, kind of joined up back with Clive to do some work with. Um, the British Olympic Association leading into the Vancouver Winter Olympic Games in 2010 and then I, I joined them full time to take over running um, a big chunk of, uh, of, of uh, support services for Team GB for 2012. So that, that involved running a, a department of doctors and physios and scientists at the BOA. It involved Clive and I running a, an elite coaching program designed to try and capture coaching knowledge and IP and also designing um, the support systems for the Olympic villages and satellite villages for London 2012. So that gave me some brilliant exposure to some of the real senior leaders in British Olympic sport in that time. And also got to experience a home Olympic Games, which was, hmm. I don't know if you remember that, it was yeah. just an absolutely stunning um, achievement. And you know, for, for people in East London particularly, I remember you know, doing the commute from Southfields in South West London all across to Stratford many, many times. Mm -hmm. Over that period of time, I watched the, the Olympic Village and the, and, the, uh, and, and the park come out of the ground you know, over a four-year period was I mean, transformational. And then to see the nation come together uh, in the way that it did around that event was, was truly special. And you know, I've, I've probably referenced back because it, it pertains to the story with England football. You know, I I vividly remember the experience of being on the top of an open top bus travelling down Regent Street um, in November 2003 with maybe a million people on the streets. Mm. And the impact, and when you look out, when I looked out of that crowd and you saw what was coming back, which you will recognise from last night, the pure emotion and joy and pride that a national team success can create is, is really um, a privilege to be part of. So 2012 was another one of those those moments. Um, and then I I spent a couple of, well, 18 months or so working in a, in a startup business. So still linked to sport, but mm. took a departure and I worked in a technology, a couple of technology startup businesses uh, run by an incredible guy called Manoj Badali. A uh, company called Blenheim Chalcott, which he and a, another chap called Charles Mindenhall founded. They they backed an idea that Clive and I had had about coaching IP, and I ran those businesses for a, sort of eighteen months, uh, learning a huge amount and making huge numbers of mistakes before the before the opportunity with the FA came up. And actually, there'd been rumours of some real change in the FA as far back as twenty twelve. But it had taken an enormous number of amount of time. It never seemed to be something that was going to happen. And um, anyway, it was ex what really excited me, I suppose, was to, to hear Greg Dyke 
talk about 2022 and his ambition, and um, and then to you know to hear Dan Ashworth had been appointed, and I, I took it upon myself to go and see Dan and connect with him, and then um, was delighted to be offered the, the job in um, 2013 and started in 2014. So, um, and then I guess we could talk about the, the experience with England during this, and perhaps what we're doing now. Yeah, yeah, I think I feel like one of the reasons I really wanted to speak to you as well was just because this time was like the incubation period that you joined. That was I feel like that was the incubation period for the success that we've got now. Um, can you explain a little bit about you know the the visions, the twenty twenty two visions that Greg Dyke had and and um, Dan Ashworth's influence? Who were the sort of the key players that um, helped you know initially drive that change of direction? Yeah, so um, you know, let's be honest. Greg, Greg um, I guess, fairly unilaterally stuck his neck out about 2022. I think he did it in, I'm not mistaken, it was late 2013, maybe, I think he, yeah. he made this announcement. And I, I was a big admirer of Greg anyway. The work he'd done at the BBC was really transformational. And he, he's, he's a brave leader. You know, he's, he's prepared to be different, he's prepared to be the lightning rod for people who um, would be naysayers. And mm. I, you know, I, but I felt it was really compelling because, you know, I'd definitely been somebody on the out, having been so passionate and committed and, and, and wedded to football my whole life, I was kind of constantly disappointed by what I saw when I'd gone in as a consultant. And I'd also, I'd, been, I'd become one of those people on the outside throwing rocks and so what intrigued me about it was the bravery to come out and say we should have the ambition of winning in 2022. And what's fascinated for me about that was, A, it was a really bold goal, which is wonderful, that's what you want. But secondly, it was long enough in the future that you had a real shot at doing it. You know, my experience tells me people tend to massively overestimate what you can achieve in a, in a short period of time, maybe a year. But, but massively underestimate what's possible over a period of four, mm. six, eight years. You can genuinely change the world in four to six years if you've got everyone behind it. So when I went for my interview with with Dan um, and eventually then with Trevor Brooking, what I really wanted to understand was how serious they were about change. Um, and the, the job that was advertised to me was kind of head of, I think it was something like head of, performance services or something of that nature mm. which was ostensibly to kind of run build and run the supporting function so you know medicine science analysis psychology blah 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 and i said to dan i said look if that's what you want someone to do genuinely you shouldn't hire me because i've sort of done that and i know how to do it and it won't really excite me you know if if you genuinely want someone who's going to provoke and challenge and and, and really someone who can help change. And I was able to articulate the sort of broader experiences I had. I said, I'm fully on board. But, you know, that that's the health warning kind of going in. Um, I want to be, I'm excited about the vision, but it needs. To, I need to know that you're serious about change and it's not just you saying it, but when it comes down to the tough decisions, we're not going to do it, we're going to shy away from it. So, um, well, that was brilliant, that was clear. And what Dan had done, I guess, um, when I joined... Gareth had been there for, well, on and off for sort of three, four years because he'd been head of elite development and then stepped down for a bit and then became under-21's coach, who was part of the group. Um, Matt Crocker had just joined. Mm. And, you know, there was, the, 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 there was a, a very broad framework of what a DNA was going to look like. There were the kind of five areas of the DNA, you know, how we play, who we are, the England player, how we coach, how we support, but there was there was nothing inside those placeholders, nothing yeah. whatsoever, and there wasn't really a strategy in place. If I'm perfectly honest, it was, you know, what what are we going to do? And it was so. What I was allowed to do um, at that point in time was was kind of poke my nose into everything, and I, I got a very early insight into the into the senior team. I got I developed a decent working relationship with Roy Hodgson. I ended up supporting them a little bit prior to the 2014 World Cup, but as you'd appreciate, I started in sort of February, March 2014, yeah. so not an awful lot of time really. So it was more 
observing what was going on rather than changing it. But that was fascinating to see what was in place and what wasn't. And to take the time to kind of wander around and look at what was in place at the FA. And I guess where we got to was, I, prior to that World Cup, I had a really clear idea of what I thought we needed to really go for and what was missing. And, you know, frankly, it coincided with a, with a fairly poor performance at the World Cup. And the, the, the third co- you know, coincidence there was that because Greg was chairman and Greg had this ambition, I was in a position with Dan out in Brazil sitting down with Greg and going, look, this is, this is what we want to do. You know, it's not there isn't no plan. We've got a we've got a vision of what this can look like in the future. So I took Greg through essentially what became the board presentation uh, that we presented actually in September of that year. Mm. You know, really highlighted what needed to change. And it was, I guess, if I give you some headlines, it was that um, I felt the FA didn't understand its role in elite performance. They kind of sat on the sidelines and sort of said, well. The clubs do the development. We just get the players for a bit. Um, we, you know, we'll, we'll do our best, but you can't really do much with them because we've only got them together for sort of eight or ten days at a time, and that's that's it. You know, kind of fingers crossed, right? Mm. And uh, we haven't got as many players playing at international level or at A grade level, you know, sort of big five league level as our competitors. So, which was correct, right? You had probably. Yeah. If you went through the numbers at the time, it was about between 50 and 60 players making a start in the Premier League compared, uh, and, and nobody playing overseas in yeah. any other league, compared to, I think I'm right in saying at the time, uh, Italy had about 180 players uh, per week. France weren't far off that. Germany were about 110, 120. So you could look at those numbers and go, oh, well, what can we do about that? Because we can't change that because it's all about the Premier League and money and blah, blah, blah. But I kind of, as a result of the experiences I've had elsewhere, I kind of went, look, there's a whole load of things that we can't control like that. Okay, that's, if that's going to change, it's going to change slowly. We can't immediately influence that. But what we can control is what we do with England, what we do with our DNA, how we think creatively and how we think differently to our competitors. Because if we look at Germany, Spain, France, Brazil, Argentina, they will all have certain things which are in their favour, whether that's the size of their playing base, their connection to their national Mm. team, the relationship between the federation and the league. You know, some countries had closer relationships and easier levers to pull than we did. But, you know, so you have to kind of accept that there are some things you're not going to change. But with the perspective I was able to bring, I think, as combined with Dan's brilliant football perspective, Matt Crocker's excellent insight from a development perspective, Gareth's experience as a player, we are able to articulate that there are a load of things here that if we choose to do differently, we can out-compete our competitors to create value. Mm. And that's what I'd refer to as the, you know, I, I remember drawing this up, but You know, if you imagine at that time, Germany were kind of perennial last four uh, in in big competitions. We were ranked about 15th, 17th in the world. We just got out in the group stages of another World Cup. You know, and and what we're saying is by 2022, Germany will be somewhere else and we will be at the top. We'll be winning. So those two lines of performance are going to cross over. And in the middle is this performance gap. It's like, what's the gap between where we are, where we want to be and where our competitors are? And, you know, my mindset is, what is it in that space, in that gap, that can make it, that we control, that can make a transformational difference to performance? Mm. So that's the nuts of what the strategy then becomes. So, you know, what I saw is, if we took coaching, at the time, um, we had very few full-time coaches at the FA. Roy Roy and his assistant, Ray Luton, were, were, were were there, but they were based in London, senior team. There were some other guys based up at St George's Park, but they tended to have two roles. One would have been a team role, and the other was a an education role. Mm. So someone like John Peacock was running the under-17s and had done a brilliant job, but he's also running the pro licence. So he wasn't fully focused on the under-17s and all the things that could be done. And, and he was there on his own, and some part-time coaches would just join him for the camps, and, mm. and that was it. And that was true across all of the age groups as well. We, compared to my experience in other sports, 
we had virtually no support services in place. And if they were there, again, you'd have a doctor and a physio and maybe, in inverted commas, a sports scientist who would, again, turn up for a camp. Yeah. We had, I think, one full-time doctor, one full-time sports scientist, some analysts who were sort of full-time who'd come across from Loughborough University, no sight, no nutrition, uh, no cultural development, um, none of that. There was no strategic plan. Uh, we had a bunch of people based at Wembley, another bunch of people at, at St George's Park. There was no technology infrastructure whatsoever mm. un- underpinning this. There was no data capture or insight. It was, you know, it was, there was nothing there, right? So what I got to present at the board in September with Dan's support was, here's, here's where we are. This is what we can control. And this is where we can play. So within that, there was some obvious stuff like building support services. But we needed to do that in a particular way through this lens of where can we gain competitive advantage. Not let's just do what everyone else is doing. Yeah. Because all you do if you do that is you get to where they were before you started trying to catch up, by which time they've already moved away again. We genuinely wanted to think differently. Around things like coaching, I'd had some wonderfully influential experiences working in rugby and seeing other sports like AFL, NFL, NBA, when I travelled and spent time with those teams, Mm. to tell me that specialisation of coaching, by which I mean not a manager, an assistant, and maybe a goalkeeping coach, but a set play coach, a kicking coach, an attacking coach, a defensive coach, those functions which we had in spades at England Rugby made a transformational difference to the development of the best players. And I knew it could, I'd seen it working. And in my view, there was no reason why that couldn't work in football other than the cultural inertia people brought to it, which we know. And and look, what I found across my career, there there is always a moment whenever you go into a new sport where someone will say, ah, yeah, but we're different. You know, that won't work here. And... The reality of that is sometimes it's based on fear. Often it's a lack of experience of different environments. Um, And in my experience, it's generally not true, you know, because really fundamentally what we're talking about when we talk about performance is changing behaviours, which is about people and connections and relationships and learning, whether that's learning how to become more physically robust or it's learning the tactical nuances of a, of a system that we're playing or uh, learning how to do some of the fundamentals more effectively so mm-hmm. that they stand up under pressure. So, you know, that that was how I saw the landscape. And I guess that was where we started from and building that vision with the board to say, look, here's the plan. This is what it's going to cost. This is a radical reform and restructure of, of what performance of the FA looks like. And Greg Dyke backed us, backed us completely because he, he saw this organisation that was trying to be all things to all people. It was trying to be governance and regulation and participation and everything. You know, it was like we've, he said, we've got so many stakeholders and we're trying to keep them all happy. We've got no chance of doing that. And we're not, we're not, not only are we not keeping them all happy, we're not delighting any of them. And I want this organisation to be known first and foremost as the custodians of England team performance because the other stuff is all emboldened and and amplified if we get that bit right. So he backed quite a radical redistribution of funds from different areas of the FA into elite teams at St George's Park. And then we began the whole process of restructuring and hiring and and embedding the whole set of principles that um, over, over the next sort of six years or so. So that's really where it started. Yeah, you answered about five of my questions in that answer. That was brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry. A bit, a bit of an area I wanted to just go in with a bit more of a microscope in. Uh, well, you know what you were talking about there was, um, you know, the youth development side because it, you know, from from my perspective, it does feel like. The talent that's being produced is better, better coached, more technically gifted. Um, you know, I know that a lot of the development happens in the clubs, but or the majority, the vast majority does. But what has the FA sort of done to, you know, maximise 
their chances of producing that more technical footballer that can really compete at the highest level now? Yeah, so um, you can, you're completely right. In a lot, of, if not the vast majority of the credit for the technical improvements in, in young players has, has come from the Triple P programme and the work of the clubs. Yeah. Um, you know, you've heard Gareth talk about this. Um, there, there was a, a feeling back in the early sort of 2010s and that part of the decade that English footballers were not technically comparable to our overseas European competitors. And it was likely true at that stage. And so the shift within academies to a more technical style of development, the, the overinvestment into the time commitment of coaching has clearly really reaped the rewards. And so as you look down the pathway, you could see more technically gifted players coming out of academies and, and being picked. Now, so, so then, as you say, what's England's role within that? Well, I guess this is where the DNA comes together. You have to start with a clear vision of how you want to play the game. And um, you know what style, what principles are going to underpin that, and um, sometimes that gets conflated and confused by this idea of winning or winning now. Um, and it was a point in time where Dan and, and Gareth and Matt and others were, um, you know, were, were keen to kind of put put down some markers about it. We want England to be regarded as a, you know, a high tempo, technically gifted team who could compete with any other team in the world on that basis so I guess that's the first point right because that gives you your north star about how you want to play the game and the beliefs that sit behind that which then as you go then down the pathways if you align everybody behind that gives a clear uh, direction for selection so you then start to really think about what types of players you're picking at each age group you, you, you and but there are a multitude of factors within this, but, but that's one of them. The rest of it then is things like, okay, what does our pathway need to look like? And one of the early decisions was that we needed teams at every single age group, you know, under 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21s. So we didn't have big gaps between developmental experiences for players at international level. So that was a key factor. Um, another key factor was was, I'll come on to specialist coaching later, but I think a key factor is putting the right coaches in the right spots and making sure they understand their role and responsibilities at that age group. So Matt and I did quite a lot of work on what became a sort of a, what we called it, a pathway overview, which was essentially the strategic plan for each of the levels of the pathway. So what are the expectations at under-15s for how we play, how we coach, our culture, our mm. physical performance? What are all those things? And and then for the person coaching them, what are the expectations as outcomes? Because probably in the past, most coaches would have expected to be judged and probably implicitly were judged by results. And of course, they're not unimportant, but... If you just think about results at early stages of development, 15, 16, then there's a danger you pick players who are physically more capable, maybe more mature, um, and you miss the opportunity to pick players who are actually going to be the players in the future who have the capability of playing the way you ultimately want to play. So, mm -hmm. in other words, if you want great decision making, great technical decision making players who can open up defences at senior team level. What do they tend to look like at 14 and 15? Well, you might see players who make a lot of mistakes, who take quite a lot of risks because they're experimenting and they're trying. And if you write them off because they keep giving the ball away, well, you're going to miss some incredible talent. And, and some of that is influenced by, if you're a coach of that age group who's, who, kind of under, who thinks he's being judged by whether he wins or loses, then you're probably not going to pick those players. So some of those factors are vitally important to get people into the England pathway. And then, as kind of an overall factor, um, I very much felt, um, and I know Dan and, and Matt and others the same, that we weren't playing our part. So let's say, well, let's say we've got those factors right now. We've got a playing style that's aligned. We've got some coaches who understand that their job isn't winning, it's development. That's great. 
but we needed to add more to that. You know, how, how did we really plan the experiences and the year and the development for the 50 or 60 days that we have those players? Yeah. Are we going to stand on the sidelines and kind of go, it's just all about the game and you know, making sure there's a nice development experience and let's sort the games program out and make sure it's nice and competitive, which is another big factor, by the way, because we had too many poor quality games. But you know, if that's all it is, I think my, my philosophy is you were leaving lots on the table. You need to lean into the fact that, yes, the majority of development happens at the clubs, but that doesn't mean that the international experience can't play a really key role. So we wanted players to have a duality of experience. You're, you're contracted to your club, your club is your, your, your day-to-day. But we want England to be a part of your life forever. We want it to be part of your journey too. And so um, I knew from my rugby days how influential an international experience can be. You know, so if you could connect young men and women to the emotion behind representing your country, you know, and that's part of their why. They see that as part of their identity. And then you create an amazing development experience around them. And then during that development experience, even if it's only 50 days a year, you start to challenge the standards that they've got, which then influences their practice and work ethic habits when they go back to their clubs. And that's a win-win for everybody. Mm. Well, I think what sometimes we spend too much time dwelling on the potential conflict between club and country, um, or you know, club versus country, it can genuinely be club and country. Yeah. You know, I don't think you need to fall out about whether this 15-year-old is a right back or a wing back or a right winger, or whether he's playing in a four-four-two or three-five. So whatever. It's more about what are the traits and characteristics that we want to see, and how do we help to do that? So, you know, maybe if we can give you an example. It's not technical, but culturally, you know, we one of our areas we felt I felt very strongly was that we needed to develop a culture around our teams that um, created more resilient, more capable leaders at the top end of the game. Mm. And um, you know, what I was told when I came in is, oh, we really need lots of sports psychology. You know, we've got to, you keep missing penalties. We need sports psychology, and I didn't really see that because. Yeah, okay, penalties are important and things like that. But the amount of time you've got with individuals at international level means that you're unlikely to really help give them the skills to manage high-pressure situations in any meaningful way. But what you can do is create a culture around them that means that they feel very connected to this international experience. It, it, It resonates with their own journey. They feel at home there. And we can give them leadership and development experiences at international level that maybe clubs are not yet prepared to give them. And mm. I guess the, the big banner for me that I used to say a lot was that, which was a way of kind of, um, how would I put it, um, was, was trying to manage some of the inevitable tension at the beginning of this journey. And, and maybe some of my colleagues who were more embedded within the game were maybe more concerned about the impact of some of the things we were trying and how they might be perceived within the wider football game. In other words, oh, I'm not sure yeah. they're going to like that. You know, my, my, my rallying call was international is different. In, in other words, you know, we're not together every day or every week. Uh, we get together intermittently throughout the year for up to you know, 50, 60 days. And when we are we're travelling, we're together for 24 hours a day. Um, you know, as a coach, it's different because you've got a lot of, lot more time when you're not coaching than, you, than when you are. You're, you've got lots of different constraints. So that idea of internationally is different is, is, is true in reality. Yes, when the whistle blows and the game starts, it's the same game. But everything else around it is, is really different. So why, therefore, would, it, would we work like a club? You know, we're going to need to work differently. And hence, that gave us some permission, both for clubs and with players, to say, look, we've got a long-term ambition of where we want to be. And there's, there's, there's a clear history of where we've been, which, by the way, for you young guys, is not your fault. You haven't been part of anything. Mm-hmm. But we're going to be different in the future. And so we need you to be open-minded 
to try things when you hear that you might not experience at your club. Um, and that's where I think we really needed to step up as an international governing body and where the real gap was. We, we weren't, England weren't pulling their weight, put it that way. Yeah, uh, I've got just three more questions for you, really, but um, I wanted to just go a bit more in on the players themselves. So, um, sort of, do you see a bit of, you know, not ju- obviously the FA's vision on coaching on on the England DNA in this group of players, and um, is there any stories from, you know, the players that that kind of warms your heart, you know, when you look at it and think, yeah, that's that's what our work was about. Yeah, look, I think um, the where would I pick a couple of things out? Um, I mean, there are there are loads of stories about how you know. But so some some of the guys coming through, you know. But one of our big mantras was around player ownership. You know, players really uh, taking responsibility for their own learning. Um, you know, taking responsibility for the, for the way the game is played and debriefed and and, and getting involved in the process of, of game planning. You know, so in other words, it's we're a team and therefore it doesn't mean the coaches do all the work and you guys just listen to it and go and do it. We want you to get more involved. And for some for some players that was and I would I will say it still is at senior le- level quite a foreign experience yeah. there are still senior players who when we started were very uncomfortable with that process of engagement because their environments at senior team level with you know what I would call unicorn coaches who are quite hierarchical is you sit there I'm going to tell you what to do and then you go and do it and you know you you will be able to name some of those coaches mm-hmm. as well as I can my experience tells me it's far more powerful when you work together as a team and, and the insight that players bring from their perspective of the game is incredibly powerful. So I saw that very early on when Roy Hodgson kind of was, you know, he adopted some of the thoughts we had around things like unit meetings, so smaller group meetings with the back four, the front players, the midfield, that kind of thing. And when you cross fertilise that. So for example, Wayne Rooney being part of a back four session and being able to give the perspective of the centre forward and what the centre halves are doing and the challenges is, is a wonderful example of that. Mm. But but also, you know, for more the, the, the current group, you know, many of whom I don't know as well actually because they've come through later than uh, I knew I was I was there, but they would have been exposed in, in the under nineteens and the seventeens, uh, the twenties, to an environment with coaches like Aaron Dent where they're expected to contribute. They're expected to lead a debrief. They're expected to have a voice. Um, you know, they're expected to critique their own performance. So those things work well. And, but then also around some things like specialist coaching. I remember when Alan Russell first started working with the senior team, so he was fundamentally at that stage coaching, finishing with the strikers. And, you know, Alan had some very good technical instruction. And again, when I'd started, there was this sort of reticence for people to get to get into coaching the basics of technical instruction with the best players, which is one of the things that I think is the most powerful thing you can do. Mm. You know, we did that with England rugby players all the way through. Every player can get better. Doesn't matter if it's Harry Kane with however many caps, or you know, it, it, it's. Um, it's uh, Saka with with many fewer, right? If your belief is these guys can get better and you're prepared to step into that space, you can really improve them. But at the early stage of the journey, it was was not necessarily accepted. So I remember seeing Alan doing a session on finishing with Harry Kane, Jesse Lingard, Marcus Rashford, those guys, and he was getting quite technical. And I was looking at that, thinking, this will be interesting to see how they receive this information. And I remember seeing Marcus, who's an exceptional individual, um, kind of um, you know, going along with it for a bit, and you could kind of see him, didn't really engage. Um, and then I saw Alan doing some stuff around kind of hip rotation and how he was striking the ball. And 
And then I saw Marcus come over kind of five minutes later and they're having a conversation and you can see from their body language that's exactly what they're talking about. He's interested to know, okay, what is that I'm doing then technically? That's meaning I'm you know, I'm 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 hitting that ball badly. And so I'm thinking, bingo, here we go. These these guys are no different from any other sports person I've ever worked with. It, it's about the development environment you create around them. And if you've got good people who the players recognise can help them get better, they'll engage. And, and that's a really important experience. And that's what I saw in the power of the specialist coaching model further down the pathway as well. So it's not then always just game focused you've got the tactical yes but then you've got the technical development side of things as well which is really powerful um, yeah we've we've talked a lot about the sort of under the surface stuff but south gareth southgate is um you know a lot of the focus um you know from from our perspective um what do you think he's sort of done to bring it together and what was your experience of working with him yeah so um so i I first met Gareth when I joined the organisation in 2014, and he was one of the first guys to sort of invite me out for dinner. I think the first night I, I stayed up at St George's Park, which is a mark of the sort of guy he is. He's, you know, he's a he wants to get to know people and understand people, and, and that's his super strength. Um, I I got to work with him as part of the sort of senior management team in the initial phases as we were um, putting things together, and then when he became in, uh, under 21 head coach I supported some of the early work he did um, and was really there with Dan Ashworth sort of advising him a bit or even old goes hopefully not um, too condescending to say maybe mentoring a little bit in certain areas for the after the 2015 Euros mm. and then when he took over in uh, 2016 I worked very closely with Gareth um, for that period from when he started all the way through um well, really till I left in, in 2019. So that was absolutely around the, the creating a strategy and, and a plan for the, for the senior team to, to, to win. Um, but also I was involved in delivering some of the cultural work and the identity work that we did together. So, I mean, your question is, how does he bring it together? I think, it, you know, as a parent with the 21s, he's somebody who, who wants to learn and develop himself. And he's, he's someone who creates a really safe environment for players to be themselves. So the idea of psychological safety um, is really important. He's not a shouter or a baller. He, rec- he recognises the emotional impact decisions and communication have on people and whether that makes them more or less likely to, to speak up. He, he understands the power of informal conversations and communications with players as opposed to everything being done in a big meeting room and, and you know that's the only time you really communicate and so you know I, I guess I saw that if you like raw talent in the early stages and I saw a guy who was really prepared to, to work on it as well as someone who was very prepared to to step aside from the stuff he didn't know how to do or he wasn't as good at so you know I think what you know, so things like planning and strategy, he would be the first to admit it's not his thing. He's not that, you know, he doesn't really know how to do it, mm. but he recognises the value in it. And so he supported me to be able to run that piece of work equally. Um, he recognises the power of his own voice and he's a great, um, he's a good storyteller. He understands the importance of the narrative for the players. He understands his role as the person carrying the story. Um, and I think what he's enabled through his selection and in creating those, that safe environment to happen is that um, through his brave selections, he's creating an environment where young players can come in and thrive mm. because they don't feel the pressure of the, the hierarchies that used to exist when I first arrived, where there were clear delineations and... and um, conflicts between some of the senior players and if not an overtly hostile environment it certainly wasn't a friendly environment it would have been a tough environment for a young player to come into and thrive whereas I think you see now it it's never easy but it, it's it's much it's much easier for somebody to come in and be accepted very quickly because because of the journeys of people like Marcus Rashford but also because of the 
the style of leadership Gareth puts in place and the humility he operates in that then other players mirror. You know, it, it, you, you yeah. of course take your lead from from the leader, and so if the leader shouts and bawls and talks down to people and belittles people and makes them feel uncomfortable then certain personalities within the group will take that as an okay to behave that way. Mm. Gareth is the complete opposite of that. And so that doesn't mean he's soft, but it, it means that people will take their cue from that. And so, you know, that there's much less hierarchy involved. Yeah, there are more senior players, but they recognise and understand their role as mentors and leaders and their role as helping people to be embedded within the team rather than almost putting up the barrier and, and forcing people to prove that they're good enough. Mm. You know, I think the, the mantra is much more about how do we help you get comfortable here so you can show us what you can do rather than, you know, if you can show us how good you are, then you'll get comfortable, if that's, a, if that's one way of explaining it. Yeah, yeah, really good way. I think that, um, yeah, Gareth is just somebody who, um, whoever he deals with, you know, they'll they'll maybe have a story to tell about Southgate. So many of my um, colleagues in in the media have like brilliant stories about Gareth, about nice things he's done or said, or time he's taken out. You know, even with third party people who he, you know, it's not a core part of his responsibility. I would say, you know, even you know me as well. When I was a bit younger, he he spent time talking to me about being at the World Cup and stuff like that. So yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, I think it. Probably the point I make on it is, is you know, everybody's got their own biases of where they feel comfortable and where they operate best, if you like. And yeah. I would say Gareth is very strongly in the, he's, a, he's an empathiser and he's a relationship builder. And, uh, you know, for people who have got less of a bias than that, they may be more objective or planner. Right. Then, then it's not, then what is amazing to, to recognise in someone like Gareth is, the amount of effort that goes into um, relationships and, and, and strong communication. It's easy to kind of look on the outside and go, oh, yeah, he's a nice guy, and I can see why people get on with it. But as you say, there's a huge amount of small talk and small gestures and small communications over a prolonged period of time yeah. that, build, that build the trust in those relationships. And that takes, it takes awareness as a leader, to, to recognise that it's important, it, it, it takes empathy to kind of go, when's the right time to speak and when's the right time to say it? And then it takes a big time investment. Yeah. You know, and, and I think it, it, it's one of the things I definitely see with him that um, I think he's commented on it. When, when there are short camps, 10 days or so, and two games, I think he finds it quite exhausting because there's lots of decisions to make and almost not enough time for that other stuff mm. to the level he would like to be able to do it. Um, whereas in the downtime between camps and in a longer period like a, a Euros or a World Cup, there is it's still pressurised, of course, but there's actually more time for those informal conversations to happen, which I guess would, would satisfy his leadership style, but also give him great comfort in his connections with people so um, you know that's where I where I see him really bringing it together and I think he's um, you know as I said before he's, he's self-aware enough to recognize the areas in which he needs help and good people around him. Yeah that's brilliant I'm conscious I've had your time for quite a while now already so just wrap it up by just saying you know, in in um, 2019, you eventually left the FA, um, and yeah, I mean, that must have been a tough decision because you've had some brilliant experiences. You are a football man, so just wanted you to explain, you know, leaving and what you did after as well. Yeah, so um, I mean, fundamentally, I left because the the kind of wasn't. I'd got as far as I could go to some extent. So, you know, part of your role, I think, in these organisations is actually to kind of make yourself redundant. You want to set up the <laughs> systems and processes and people and, and, and embed them so that they're happening. You know, otherwise, you know, what is legacy if if the moment you, you leave, nothing else happens? You know, I'm proud to say that a lot of the stuff that I was able to influence still, still happens. And, and the other side of it was... You know, I, I did have ambitions to move up to maybe more of a technical sporting director type role, but the um, the FA at the time and 
probably still football more generally still sees that role in, in quite a um, I would say necessarily say traditional but they have a particular silhouette of that role which is typically either somebody with a recruitment or a coaching background um, which is quite different when you look across other sports where you know what they tend to call performance directors which is the same role as a sporting director really can come from a number of different backgrounds because there's a recognition of the leadership skills that are required and strategic skills that you know that really should trump all the other stuff so that that was really the, the reason that i decided it was time to, to move on and, and yeah it was a tough decision because um you know as i've experienced with rugby that uh, i'm a hugely patriotic person i, I i've been privileged and, and recognized the impact that sports performance at national level has on a nation and there's nothing more special than than experiencing that and so it's hard to walk away from that but but i'm i i'm not a um i, I get uncomfortable with things not changing or moving forward so you need, you need to recognize when you've had the impact you need to have and then move on to the next thing and, and, and let that happen so i'm, I'm still involved in football my, my business now is about working with investors in football to you know transform and disrupt how football happens at club level because I, I still believe there's an awful lot of potential to, to change positively to, to really embrace the diverse thinking and and bring together the the, the the brilliant insights from hardcore football people and combine them with similarly amazing insights and experiences from people who've worked in in, in other industries and other sports you know that that combination for me is powerful and you'll know that you know many of the guys I brought into the FA Reese Long who runs all of the analysis came from Welsh Rugby Union Bryce Kavanagh who heads up all the performance stuff now is came from um, well Aussie rules netball cricket um, etc right never worked in football at all mm -hmm. and I put a big value on on that I think you can have too much, if you like, industry-specific knowledge and not enough wider knowledge. If, and, and that's what excites me. And that's what I'm, you know, that's the next part of the journey for me is, is how can I help create change elsewhere within football to, to drive performance. Awesome, yeah. Well, um, I think that's pretty much everything I, I need to, to ask you, really, unless there's um, anything you think I've missed. But, um, yeah, that was brilliant. Um, I think it gave a really good overview of the the sort of, uh, you know, what's gone on with England over the years, over the recent years. So um, that's great. And, yeah, it's good to see yeah them doing so well. And, and it's good to talk about England positively. I mean, this is the first time in, in my career where I've gone this deep and being that positive about England uh, football. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it is wonderful. It's, uh, you know, I'll go back to you know, the early days. I remember sitting with, with Gareth and Matt and, and Dan part of our strategic thinking was looking ahead over the next four, six, eight years. And we start in 2014, we were kind of plotting what we thought the results trajectory could look like. And, you know, it's really gratifying when you're starting to see that come together. Um, and, and whilst 2022 was the, was the original marker for winning, it's, it's okay to win before that, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no one's going to, no one's going to complain if you know, if you win before that. So, um, yeah, it's wonderful to see what's going on, and, and it's, it's great that you guys are, you know, people like you are taking a wider interest because I think it is important that you know, a wider group of people, as as, as an amazing job Gareth is doing, you know, he, he will, I'm sure, acknowledge he's, he's a lightning rod for it all. That's yeah. that's quite right, but I'm sure he'd also acknowledge there's a lot of other people behind the scenes who've contributed to where to where things are. And, um, yeah, you know what. My hope, and I think probably one for another time, might be, you know, where's the FA after this? Because I guess I experienced it in rugby, right, that you, you could win something and the organisation thinks everything's OK. Yeah. And, and actually, that is a watch out for the FA because where they are at the moment, apologies for starting, I wouldn't include this in your article. No, no, no. For another time, but just and not wishing to be negative, but... It, you know, as a result of some leadership changes after Dan left and 
budget cuts and all the rest of it as a result of COVID, but also more strategically. Yeah. A lot of the stuff that I've talked to you about in the development team just does not exist anymore. Yeah. So, you know, the question has to be asked. I think, look, this, this group of senior team players, there's enough of a nucleus there to sustain that for at least another couple of years. But you have to ask yourself, what's happening to the pathway now in the future? Mm. So, you know, the, the real goal, so as, as much as we planned forward from 2014 about winning, it was not about winning once. It was about sustaining success. Yeah. You know, because a, a, a nation like England, with the resources that it has, should be perennial top four finishes in any yeah. global tournament. You know, that's where we should be. But you have to work hard to stay there because... You know, a lot of people start chasing on your heels when you uh, when you start to get a bit of success. So I think that's you know for me, I hope they win someday. You know they've definitely got a chance of doing it. They're, they're mm. a could win, not a definitely should win team. Yeah. And yeah. then Qatar looks really exciting, of course. But we want to be a team. You know who who wants fifty five years before the next one, right? You want to be yeah. you want to be always up there, and the expectation is England. Are always at least semi finalists. It's no shock. It's and we win more than our fair share. That's that has that was the goal from the start. So yeah. delighted to see us at this part of the journey, and nothing would make me prouder than than to see them keep it.